So hello again, everybody. Thanks to those of you who've tuned in and welcome to today's BU Alumni Career Webinar, The Future Built by Women, Using Tech for Good. My name is Jeff Murphy. I'm a member of the Alumni Career Engagement Team in the BU Office of Alumni Relations. Today's event is offered to our 385,000 alumni around the globe, of course, all of our current students. And we appreciate everybody who's joined us. Again, some of you from some very far places that are very far away from our Boston campuses. Throughout your career, BU is committed to helping you define and achieve your professional goals. And we do this by providing everyone with access to a series of valuable programs, tools, and online communities. In addition to this webinar series, one of our most exciting resources is a free online community called BU Connects. If you haven't already signed up, I hope you'll take five minutes after this presentation to log in and set up your profile for free at buconnects.com. We have over 28,000 BU alumni and students already on BU Connects. It's the very best place to build your professional network with other terriers, join regional groups, special interest groups, become a mentor, find a mentor, or both. Uh, again, check that out at buconnects.com. Before today, uh, before I introduce today's speaker, just a few housekeeping notes. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be made available for on-demand viewing on the Alumni and Friends website, which you can find at bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is eager to answer any questions that you, ha you have, and you're welcome to submit them throughout the presentation uh, by hovering over your screen and selecting the Q&A option. Uh, you can go ahead and type in your question at any time, uh, and we'll make sure to save some time at the end to get to those. I'll also keep my eye on the chat if you're a little bit more used to uh, asking questions that way. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day, author, entrepreneur, and speaker, and Metropolitan College Masters alum, Brooke Markovicius. Brooke's a recognized startup product leader, a keynote speaker, and is celebrated for her keen insights and mission-driven leadership. She's the author of the forthcoming book, The Future Built by Women, Creating a Brighter Future Through Tech and Innovation, which was published with Wiley. Uh, transitioning from the nonprofit sector, Brooke harnessed tech to effect meaningful change. While balancing her roles as a mom of two and a founder of the innovative startup Alubi, Brooke guided the platform to a notable acquisition. She's featured in Forbes, Fast Company, and more. Brooke ardently champions women in tech and entrepreneurship. She now resides, as we mentioned, in Durham, North Carolina, where she harnesses technology for profound good and invites women to combine passion with technology, forging a future where women lead with assurance. Please make sure that you check out her website at brookmarkovicius.com. Brooke, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Thank you. For those of you who signed up for our original date and we had to reschedule, I was sick. So thank you all for, for your patience. I'm really glad we were able to, to do this again, Brooke. And uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to you if you want to go ahead. And I know you've got a slide deck to share and, and then we'll be off and running. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. And um, like Jeff said, if you have any questions throughout, just go ahead and put them in that Q&A or in the chat. And I promise I'll get to them and save plenty of time for questions, especially with the topic today. I think it's always great when we can come together and ask questions in a room um, where women are being brought to the, the forefront um, of that. So thank you for having me today. And I'm excited. I um, told my kids I was talking at BU today and they told me I had to wear my BU shirt. So I am repping um, the Terriers proudly today. Um, I am in Durham, North Carolina today, so it's nice to see people from all over the world. Um, I wanted to start out with a question today just for you to think about as we go through. Um, I wrote a whole book about this, so it's something that is near and dear to my heart, but what does a future built by women look like to you? And I asked this question to several people as I was starting to write my book, and it's something that I've always kind of thought about because we often don't talk about what a future built by women could look like. And today, as I go through um, sharing lots of information with you, I hope that you gain some insight about how women have already built the future and have been a part of that future building, but also how you can be a part of building the future. I think that oftentimes we put um, 
you know, put people in in a box of, you know, here's the innovators of the world. Here's the big, you know, uh, company founders and uh, corporate leaders. And we forget that oftentimes the biggest movements and the biggest change comes from just everybody, the everyday person um, that might be you. And I think that we can all forge and build a future um, that we really want. And so we're going to talk about how you can do that um, and also how you really can use technology for good. So think a little bit about what a future built by women would look like to you. It's really interesting um, to hear some of the ways that people uh, think about that. So today we're just going to share a little bit about why me, why am I sharing this information, how women have really led the way in building the future. We're going to talk about some gaps that could hold us back or help us move forward. Um, I'm going to share with you the framework um, that I created that has helped me in my career in tech, um, as well as it might help you in your future as you are going through your career. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I call the entrepreneurial equation that can be used both in entrepreneurship and what I call intrapreneurship in your career where you might still be in a nine to five. We're going to talk a little bit about a tech toolbox that you can build for yourself and how we can really build the future together. So let's dive in. Um, like Jeff mentioned, I'm an alum of BU. I went to BU for grad school. Um, after I had been in a career of nonprofit and education, and I found that I was always the person that was fixing everybody's tech issues and really had loved tech from a young age, but didn't see myself going into tech. Um, my dad's a preacher, my mom's a teacher. It was not a path that I even knew anything about until I ended up meeting my husband and he was working at Microsoft and it was something that I saw as an opportunity for myself to build the future in some way through learning more about technology. I'm a mom of two kids um, and also have two rescue doggies that are right in front of me here um, on the floor as I do this presentation today. I love to run, hike, read, cook, and also have really deep intellectual conversations about the future and the past. I was a history major in undergrad, so I really love diving into that cause and effect and um, all of the different past things that I think help us figure out how we can really build the future. And like you mentioned, I have a book coming out, which this uh, presentation does bring up some of the things in my book, but it's also kind of my lived experiences in my career and how they can help support you. So this is a, an excerpt from the book, but I really want us to think about and continue this um, kind of visualization in our mind as we go through today of imagining a world where technology and innovation is are really guided by diverse perspectives. So maybe you're here and you are a female, maybe you're also a mom, maybe you are um, a male ally, maybe um you come from a different country or you're in a different economic status than other people that you're working with, whatever it might be, I think bringing these diverse perspectives together really allow us to bring more creativity together um, and help us to really work through gender boundaries and different areas that come up and prevent women from really stepping into tech and stepping into building the future. I hope that through this conversation today, you will feel a little bit more equipped and inspired to go out and take on some future building. So one thing that I learned in my research of building this book that I wrote about the future built by women is that women have really been building the future for a long time. And oftentimes their stories really aren't present. So you might have heard of some of these people here on the screen um, because they're some of the more famous women that led the way. Um, you might not have heard of some of these women, but they are just a small amount of people um, in the bigger picture that really have helped to shape the future um, for a very long time. And I specifically picked out people um, to share today that really had an impact on technology and specifically elements of technology that you might be familiar with and um, understand. But also 
I want to make sure that you understand too, that women really are using technology today and in the past for all kinds of different ways of building the future and making change in the world. And it might not be that they're creating a software program or building a tech company, but they could be using it as simply as using social media to impact change in the world. Um, whatever it might be, um, there's many ways that we can use tech for good. So the first person that I always like to bring up, I call her the queen of code, um, Ada Lovelace. Uh, she really was one of the first computer programmers that there were. So even though tech and computer programming is a very male-dominated field, it really started with a female. And I think that's important for us to make sure that people understand that story um, because she really uh, was the one that took her mathematical um, really her mathematical genius of herself. And she collaborated with a guy named Charles Babbage on working through what would be a revolutionary analytical engine. So she was really at the forefront of creating code from the very early ages. Um, her visionary insights uh, really went into allowing machines to process more than just numbers and it laid the groundwork for what would become modern computing. So Ada really was that queen of code and really helped us to see that women were a part of the initial literal building of code um, from an early age. Uh, the next person is Hedy Lamar. Um, she actually was a film actress by profession. So this also brings up a cool thing um, within everything that goes on um, with building the future is you can be in any type of industry or background. You do not have to be in tech to be a part of using technology for good or using technology to build the future. You could be an actress. You could be in marketing. You can be in whatever background. Um, you could be in education. Um, I think it's important for us to think outside of the box because having been in tech, having built a tech company, I know that the best insights I got were really from the background I had in education and nonprofit and working with small businesses. That information was more valuable than just my ability to code. I really was able to bring that insight, that information, that empathy, um, that experience into how I built with code. And the code and the technology was just the tool that would help me get to what I wanted to build. And so Hetty was um, helping to develop a frequency hopping um, spread spectrum, which is basically a communication system um, that was helping to uh, use radio controlled, um, like it was using radio to um, prevent torpedoes from the, or allowing torpedoes to be intercepted during World War II. And a lot of this early groundwork that was coming from women working in technology and coding really happened during World War II, um, which was an interesting time because women actually were being brought into the workforce. We actually had child care in the United States that was helping with the kids at home so women could actually come into the workforce. So some interesting things happened in the World War II era, but her invention um, ended up actually being the basis for modern Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and GPS, which we obviously all use on a regular basis. Um, but that came from a woman. Um, the next person is Grace Hopper. You might have heard of her. She was an admiral in the U.S. Navy. Um, I call her the compiler queen. Um, she was actually one of the first programmers with the um, Harvard project. So at Harvard, um, they had what was called the Mark I computer. And even though a lot of her story is known, there's several people that worked with her that her their stories haven't been told very broadly. I talk about it a, quite a bit in the book about another project called the ENIAC project, which actually is a group of about 10 secretaries that were working at Harvard um, at the time and uh, working with the U.S. Uh, Navy that ended up coming together to work on the earliest programming documentation for the Mark I and Mark II computer. They learned how to code in what would be called COBOL language, which that language is 
still used today. It's pretty rarely used, but um, kind of a fun fact, my neighbor, um, who is an older woman um, that lives next to us, she actually was one of the early programmers of COBOL and still is a COBOL programmer here in North Carolina, um, which is a really cool thing that someone that helped to be one of the early future builders lives next to me and was an inspiration for me going into writing my book as well. Um, but Grace Hopper is really well known in the women in tech space. There is a conference called, um, the, named after her, that is a women's um, conference for tech. And she really was kind of the first leader um, and very vocal leader. She's actually the person that the idea of bugs and computer bugs comes from. Um, she said that we should be able to squash those bugs. Um, and so she's a really uh, big leader in, in women in tech. The last person um, is Katherine Johnson, who I call the space race virtuoso. Um, she is one of the first African-American mathematicians that we learn a lot about. Um, and she worked at NASA and actually my uncle, uh, my great uncle, um, he worked at NASA at the same time as Katherine, um, which is a really cool thing. I wish I had been able to ask him more about her. Um, but they worked there at the same time um, during a very important era of John Glenn and Alan Shepard's missions. And she was in charge of really helping with the calculations that would allow for the success of the first U.S. Um, crewed space flights. And so she was a huge part of um, using that math mathematics and code to be able to allow space travel. So I love to point these women out and why I tell their stories is because oftentimes we don't hear the women's side of how we've built the future up to this point. And I want to make sure that that changes as we go into the future, that your story, maybe you start going out and building something one day, or you already are building something, or you're working on a project in your company that's helping to make big impact. I want your story to be known. And I think that starts with us just talking more to one another and sharing each other's stories, but also writing about them and making them known in public settings. And so I think it's important for us to, to bring them up um, in these environments as well. So as we go into building the future, there are things that I feel like I even was pretty naive about in many ways. Um, I started building a tech company several years ago, and I was really gung-ho about the problem I wanted to solve, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And I was like, I can do this. I have great information and knowledge and experience in this field. I have the tech skills. I'm going to go in and build a tech company. I was also a mom of two kids that were young and very little, and I was not the primary breadwinner of our family. I had a very supportive spouse, but going into that, I was just very passionate. And we'll talk about how passion is important, but I also didn't think a lot about some of the things that I call the gaps. Um, they could be roadblocks to us when we're going into building the future. Um, they also could be ideas for innovation. And I think it's really important for us to be aware of them. Um, one of the first gaps that I always hear women talking about a lot, um, whether they are intentionally talking about it or it's just coming up in, in some way, is the data gap. And what I mean by this is there, especially in this age of AI and this massive AI development that is occurring, we do not have a lot of written data from the perspective and the insight of women. And there is a great book um, about the data gap that, that I'll suggest it. Um, I can send this information. I can't remember the name right now, um, but it's by a, a lady named Caroline. And she goes into this in-depth analysis of the gaps that we see in data. And so what I mean by this is one of the areas that we see data gaps specifically are in when there is a um, natural disaster, let's say, and there's interviews and data collected around natural disasters. Oftentimes they don't even go and talk to the women about how did it impact their homes? How did it impact um, childcare? 
How did it impact their careers? It's often taken just from a male perspective and often only that data comes in. And how that data can then impact the next steps of rebuilding from a natural disaster or some major event like that is that if you're only taking the perspective of men, you could have the problem where as they go and rebuild homes or they look for information, they might leave out important elements of a home. Like they might not make a kitchen uh, big enough. They might not get childcare up and running again after a natural disaster because they didn't realize it was so important. They're just not hearing the side of the story from women. Um, there's also less data information about women that are building businesses because oftentimes we're in the thick of it when we're building. Maybe we also are moms and parents and we just have less time to sit there and, you know, share this data and this information. We also might not have the data analytics skills or the uh, time and space to write research papers about what's going on um, in what we're building. And so just that data does not end up coming into the fold, which then there's less data to train AI on and there's less data to have insights on. And so women are continually left out of the story um, and left out of the information that's used as the building blocks of the future. And so one thing that you can kind of keep in the back of your mind and how you can actually you know, step up to the plate and help data um, and this gap is really think about, is there a way that you can record more data in your company for the women's perspective? Is there ways that you can write even research papers that help you to get that data and insight information from a female and from a woman perspective? Is there a way that you can learn more about AI and machine learning and start training on various different data sets. Um, what is the way that you can help support that? So I like to bring up these gaps because oftentimes we don't think about what the possibilities are and the roadblocks. So there's a lot of ways that we can innovate too um, in the space of data. The next one is care. And this one's pretty self-explanatory, but um, care not only is in reference to taking care of children and child care, it's also for elder care and disability care. Um, I don't know how old everybody is, but I'm approaching 40 and I know that my parents are getting older. And so um, I know my dad had a big appointment at the doctor the other day that he needed help getting to, even though he's mobile and stuff like that, but he's having some health issues right now. And I know that he's aging, they just retired recently, and that's going to be another element of care that I have to look towards and think about for my career, for um, me building another company, for whatever might come, that's an impacted area specifically for women. Um, also on the childcare front, I've built a company and wrote a book while I had younger children. And so being able to navigate that was not easy. And I'm going to share in a minute about my framework for how I was able to do that. And I feel like my framework really goes um, well for not just if you're in building a company, but also if you're building your uh, career in a nine to five too. Um, but it's really important to be able to understand that care is a problem in our country, um, outside of our country, some countries do a lot better job. So if some of you are in other places where care is more accessible, it's more affordable, I'm really glad you're there and maybe don't come back to the States right now um, because it's not good here. Uh, I know that it is really hard for parents to navigate care and their careers. Um, and so there's a lot of disruption that it can occur there. I think that um, venture capitalists and investors are starting to realize how big of a market and industry care can be and how much disruption can occur. Um, and oftentimes once that starts to happen, there is more innovation that will occur in those spaces. Um, I have a lot of friends that are working really hard in this space. Um, uh, my friend uh, Eve Brodsky, who wrote the book Fair Play, you have not read this book and you are in any type of relationship and you ever think about having kids or even if you don't, just sharing the responsibilities within a household. 
Um, so you can, as a woman, have a career um, is really valuable. So go get that book, Fair Play. It's wonderful. Um, I also have a good friend that's working on care solutions in both Africa and here in the United States with a company called MH Work Life. Um, Blessing is doing a fabulous job on really making us aware of the problems in care, both in corporate America as well as in our society. Um, so if you're wanting more information about how you can dive into figuring out how we can fix the care problem in the country, um, I would definitely uh, go check that out. And then there's really cool startups that are working in this space. I have a good friend, Sarah Moskoff, who is working. Um, she's an MIT grad that is working on a company called Winnie, um, at, where they help to support child care workers as well as parents to find child care. Um, and so there's just a lot of things that can be disrupted there. But maybe it's something that you want to go work on and, and help to solve, or it's something that you can help in your own company right now um, through some sort of technology initiative or um, some sort of way of supporting in your company. So care. And then the last one is funding. Funding I look at is not just funding for tech startups or for a startup. Um, that's something that's fully impacted me over the last five to six years. But it's also something that is the lack of funding or the amount of salaries for women in tech are definitely lower than what their male counterparts are. Um, we see a huge um, discrepancy within uh, how many women are getting hired within tech as well as how many women are getting funded. Um, less than 2% of female founders get funding. I was lucky to be one of those founders that got funding. Um, for my first round of funding that I went out and raised, um, but it was not easy. And then my second round of funding was even harder. And then we ended up seek seeking an acquisition um, because of the lack of funding that there was um, in the realm for women. Um, there's a lot of money out there. Uh, it's just not being diverted towards women for a lot of different reasons. And I think that it ultimately comes down to the care and the data gap impacting that funding gap. And that's why I put it in on the screen this way, because if we don't have enough data and enough stories being told about women and the things that we're going through, the way the world is impacting us and all of the different things, if that doesn't trickle down into care and into funding and the story is really being told from a data perspective, we're not going to get where we want to go with building the future. And so I think it's really important that these gaps are made aware to more people. Um, we're talked about more as well as we start using these gaps as ways to fund and fuel our innovation. So we've talked a lot about people that are, you know, have built the future uh, previously that have helped to inspire us that have brought technology into um, our realm as women to be able to utilize to build the future. And then also about these kind of downer items of the gaps that we're facing in our society um, that are keeping women back from being able to build the future. Um, but it's so possible to still be able to build the future. And so I want to share what I use as a framework um, to be able to really take my career in tech into being an entrepreneur and then being able to get a successful exit for my company and then continue on to be able to help other women um, continue to build the future. So I do have a coding background and I, I'm definitely still very much a techie at heart, um, even though I love to speak and I love to write and all of the things. Um, and so everything within my book uh, has something to do with technology. And so the word gems actually comes from the concept of Ruby gems from the uh, coding language Ruby and Ruby on Rails, which is what I built my um, company Allobe with. And I love gems, Ruby gems, because they're basically little, like best way to describe them, like little Lego blocks um, of code that help you to build something bigger. So it's already pre-written code that allows you to build. And so that's where the idea of gems comes from, um, of Ruby gems. And gems stands for grit, education, mindset, and support. And these four elements allowed me to have the self-reflection on a regular basis, the determination, 
and the continuous improvement to be able to perform at a high level. Um, building a tech startup is something that you have to um, really dive head in and go crazy with um, to get to where you want to go. Um, but also it's the same way when you are trying to perform at a high level in your nine to five, when you're trying to take on a side hustle outside of your job, whenever you're trying to reach any goal, um, you need these different elements to help you get through and work through those bugs, those issues that can arise in our lives, our careers, um, all of these different problems that could come up. And so um, I want to share a little bit about what that looks like. So the first one is grit. And um, I loved kind of breaking down all of these words. I'm a word nerd. Um, and so I love that grit talks about it means dust, earth, or gravel. And it really signifies our courage and resolve, our strength of character. Um, and the word itself exudes a lot of determination and uh, tenacity. If you've never read the book Grit by Angela Duckworth, I highly suggest you go read that book. Um, it's a fabulous look at an in-depth look at what grit really is. Um, but I think every woman in tech and maybe any women and a woman in her career, like we need grit. Um, we're going to go through a lot of adversity, a lot of problems that are going to come up. Um, we are going to face a lot of problems. Yes, women have led the way for us. They've paved a path for us. But there are still a lot of issues that come up that maybe our male counterparts are not in that they're not as impacted by. Um, I'm amazed just at, I am an advisor to several startups and I have two startups that are male founded that they were super supportive of me and former clients actually at my, at my last company. And I love what they're building because they're building supportive things for actually women to build the future. Um, but they have such a different experience with fundraising, with getting new, uh, you know, new team members, all the stuff that. They just didn't face what I faced um, when building a company. And so it took a lot of grit for them, yes, but also a ton of grit um, on my part to be able to really build that resilience into my code of, of how I was going to build the future. And so for me, um, one of the things that really helped as I was going into uh, starting a career in tech, as well as then eventually leaving that job um, when I had my daughter, because I wanted more flexibility, and then eventually building my company is getting through all of that grit was really helpful, because I knew that even on the really, really hard days, even if I got like literally pushed into the dirt or the gravel and pushed around a little bit, that I was going to be able to get back up. And I think your reason for getting back up looks different depending on where you are in your career and in your life. Sometimes it was getting back up because I really wanted to have an impact on the future of the world. I really wanted to use technology for good. Um, some days it was because I knew my team was working really hard um, and I needed to show up for them. Um, other times it was because I wanted to show up really well as a mom to my kids and show my daughter that there is a future that she can be a part of building. Um, and sometimes it was just my stubbornness of wanting to prove everybody wrong and keep showing up. Um, but I think grit is a really big part of what you need to use and what you need to dive into. And all of these different elements of this framework, if you've ever heard of like a wellness wheel, you might have done this in like therapy or in like coaching or something, but it's all of these different elements of your um of your life. Maybe it is your relationships and your spiritual life and your career and all of these different elements. And it looks at how are you feeling in all of those areas? Do you feel like you're rating it pretty low or you're rating it higher? What does it look like? Um, and so I want you to think about this as we're going through this grit education mindset and support with this framework. Where do you feel like you need to build more? Like, do you need more grit in your life or do you need more education or mindset or support? Where are you weakest in? And that's what I want you to take away from today is how can you go and build that area of your framework deeper? So education, um, this one is something that I can thank BU for as well. Um, I, you know, 
had learned a lot on my own when it came to coding and technology, but I knew that I wanted a deeper level of education. I am not someone that can go and just teach myself everything on my own schedule and make sure that I actually do it. I need a more formal setting when it comes to education. Um, it is a deeper if I want to really learn um, a lot in a very short, you know, shorter period or condensed period of time. My husband is like the complete opposite and can go and like teach himself a master's degree, probably like himself and never need anybody. I'm not like that. I honor that. And that's why I went to grad school. And um, I appreciate the fact that I was able to leave with the knowledge that I needed to go into the tech industry. Um, it helped me get jobs. It helped me throughout my career so far. Um, but it also led me to even a deeper appreciation for continuous education and continuous knowledge building, because there's so much information out there. We have like information overload at this point with everything on the internet and now everything with AI. Um, but what we need to do is to continue to compile our knowledge to help us boot that success. So allow us to continue to bring more and more knowledge to um, our plates and allow us to learn more so we can go and solve the problems that we want to. So maybe it is solving something within our business um, that we're building. Maybe it's solving something in our career to get us to the next level. Maybe we need to go and learn more things. We need to take a course. We need to get a certification. We need to go back to grad school. We Whatever it might be that we need to do. But we need to get some sort of knowledge to help us on our path to get to where we want to go next. Now, do I think my education and um, I went for uh, history and secondary education in my undergrad, do I think that helped me throughout my career, even though now I'm in tech? I do. I feel like one of the, it was one dot that was all connected for me. Um, that helped me to get to where I was going. I think that my stop at BU was very valuable. I think that my, you know, weekly reading of research papers in the AI space is also very helpful right now. And so there's a ton of different things that you can do to increase your education on a topic. I built a company in the future, future of workspace. I was not an expert in the future of workspace when I started building in that space. Now, I do consider myself an expert in that space because I built in that space. I continually educated myself in that space. I made connections with other people that were way smarter than me that were building in that space. And I dove really deep in that area. So I encourage you that once we dive into the, the next part in a minute about your entrepreneurial equation, um, you really think about what's the element of education that you need to learn a little bit more about to help you to build the future. Mindset is the next area that I'm going to just briefly talk about. I think we all probably need a little bit of a reboot in our mindset on a daily basis, but this is something that you really want to reframe the negative thoughts that are coming in, that you can't do something, that you don't have enough education for it, that you don't have um, you know, enough, you know, things in your career that you haven't worked at a certain company that you don't know how to code, whatever it might be. I want you to reframe that in your mind and really start to think about having a positive mindset going into it. Um, there's a lot more I could do a whole talk on mindset, but I'm going to tell one story. And this is something that I hope that you can take away as you go into your next either big meeting or your career, next career advancement or whatever is a really hard time for you and your, your career or life. Um, if you've ever watched the show Breaking Bad, um, there is a scene where Jesse and Walt um, are talking and they, Walt says, you're a blowfish. And Jesse was like, what do you mean? And he's like, you know, a blowfish, they puff themselves out and they make themselves big and take up space, even though they're really small initially. And so I always think about this when I go into a big meeting, every time I went to investor meeting is how can I blow myself up? How can I take up space? How can I um, really own this meeting, the space that I'm in, um, because we often can feel small or like imposters in a situation. And so I encourage you to embrace your inner blowfish. You can just tell yourself over and over again in a mirror that you're a blowfish, you're a blowfish, you're a blowfish. And it's funny, kind of gets you a little bit laughing, um, but also allows you to really embrace that inner blowfish.
And the last one is support. I could talk about this for hours, I'm sure. Um, but uh, I always saw that Chloe said, yes, no one really knows what they're doing. No, no one knows what they're doing 100%. I can vouch for that. I'm telling you that's true um, in all situations. Everybody is a beginner in their own way. Everyone is an imposter in their own way. Um, but showing up and being in the room is the biggest struggle there is. And if you can do that, then you're already winning. So um, make sure that you reframe that in your mindset. Support, support will allow you to take on the world. And so finding a support network that allows you to really strengthen your foundation, allow you to show up in your career, into building um, a, a company, into doing whatever you want, you need to have that really good support network. And how you can build that support network is really reaching out to people. Um, a, another talk I do often is talking about how to build your network. And I started my career during a time that or changed careers uh, into tech when I was a mom of young children and I could not go out to networking events in the evening. And so I had to build my network pretty predominantly online. And it took a lot to reach out to people and be vulnerable and, you know, ask people things. Um, but there's a really good book called Reach Out by Molly Beck, and you should go get it. It has a fabulous framework of how to reach out to people and to slowly build your network in an authentic way. And now that I'm about to launch a book um, in April, I will say that the network that I've built over the last 10 years is extremely solid. And I've given so much to that network over the years that they are willing to give back to me. And that's a beautiful thing um, when you need to feel that support in your life. So I encourage you to reach out, go get that book and um, build that support. So that's the gyms framework. Um, I just want to be mindful on time too. So that's the foundation. Now we're really going to dive into how to build. I write a ton about this in my book. And I, I mentioned that because my book is really, yes, it's going to inspire you with the gyms framework. It's going to make you laugh in different ways. But it also is like a boot camp and a masterclass. Um, and so it really gives you the actual tools to go and build the future. And so if you want to take this and, and go do that, you can definitely pre-order my book. Um, but I also am going to have a ton of like uh, videos and course stuff that goes along with it that you can actually take and help you to build the future if you're wanting to really dive in and build a company or a side hustle or even bring it into your own company. So the biggest thing here I want you to take away today is what I call the entrepreneurial equation. And like I said, this can be both entrepreneur in your company, or it can be in a company that you want to build the future with. But how this looks is you're going to take what you're going to build within your tech toolbox and your passion and combine them into one to build the future in the way that you want to. And the reason that you need this passion is that passion really means intense emotion that compels action. So if we don't have a reason that we want to get up every day and keep building this future of whatever product or solution or you know showing up for our team, whatever it is, we have to have that passion behind it to keep showing up for it. Um, if I didn't, my passion and my mission was to help create flexible work solutions for moms and that's what I built with my company. And if I had not had that intense passion to do that, it would have been really hard for me to get um, to building that company for five years and get an exit with it because it was a lot of work to show up every day. And so as you start thinking about a future built by women, a future that you can help contribute to, what is something that you were super, super passionate about? Maybe it is a problem in society. Maybe it is a problem in your community, a problem that you face on a daily basis. Whatever that is, is you have some kind of passion around it? Is it something that you keep bringing up and talking to other people about? That's a really good place to start if you're wanting to dive into something. And then the technology component of it, which I'll talk about in a second, is really simple. It does not have to be something really complicated. You do not need to go learn how to completely program and be a programmer because now 
AI has really democratized computer programming and education in that realm that you can have a lot of code written for you um, by asking AI. You can add a lot to your tech toolbox with third-party tools and easy to access tools um, that allow you to really build something that you're passionate about really fast. And so all you have to be is just dangerous enough to go from that passion and combine it with the tech to get the solution that you want um, in building the future. So it's really simple to craft that toolbox. Um, it doesn't have to be something that is really complicated. Yes, you can go learn how to code, but I know that um, I think it was either the CEO at JP Morgan or one of the, the big, um, I'm pretty sure one of the big banking um, recently said that you, soon you're not going to have to learn how to code because AI is already doing it for you. But what you do need to know, and I talk about this a lot in the book too, is that you need to know how a computer thinks and what you can prompt and ask it for because it really can help you get from point A to point B extremely fast. I mean, like lightning speed now, but you need to know what to ask it. And so asking it is getting to know really about your topic, your passion, what you want to solve, and then adding that to your tech toolbox and combining those allows for that building of the future. So I really encourage everybody that's on this call today to think about how you can really make an impact on building the future, whether it's in your company or it is a company you want to create or join with somebody to create. Um, but if you're not in a place where you're ready to build yet, but I'm in a space where I built for a lot of years and I'm taking a little pause on building. Um, I do have lots of ideas. That's the downfall of being an entrepreneur. You have continuous ideas come into your head, but I'm putting them all in a parking lot for now. Um, because I feel a big compelling push to help support women in building the future. And so maybe you're not ready to build either, but how can you support other women that are building it? How can you look into solving some of the problems with the gaps that I mentioned with the data and the care and the funding? What are ways that you can support others? And so whether it's finding somebody here in the BU Connects and here through BU, which is a fabulous resource, whether it's finding somebody here or at your company or in your community, or feel free to you know reach out to me as well. Find other people that can support you, that can have these conversations about building the future together um, and really lean into that because people come from all different industries and it's better for us to make connections in all these different industries than just in one place because we have different perspectives and connections and ideas. And when we bring those together, it allows us to have really this code of collaboration where we can support and um, help each other to build the future. So that is all I have for you today. Um, but I encourage you to go and pre-order my book. Pre-orders, I'm learning this as a, as a first-time author, but um, pre-orders really help you as an author to be put into um, actual bookstores and also um, hopefully to help me one day write another book as well. I loved the process of writing a book even more than I thought I would, um, but really this is a resource guide um, to help you to be just dangerous enough with technology, learn how to build, and really that like accelerator and boot camp come together um, to help you build the future. So I want to be able to answer questions now. Um, Jeff, I'll just dive into these first ones that are in the Q&A first. Great. Um, Some great questions from Olivia. Yeah. Um, yeah, feel free. Go ahead. Brooke. Okay. So let's see here. Just no, not in everybody can see them. I think only you and I can. Okay, I'll, re I'll read it. It might be so, uh, I don't know. I don't know what okay. I'm doing. I know. I don't know actually either. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, Olivia asked in the book, how women rise, there are a lot of highlights in the book about how women in the past generations have been raised and why that impacts their success at work. What's your perspective on making sure that those same questions, um, those same behaviors, sorry, making sure that those same behaviors to future generations or how to change the structure that holds women back or so they aren't celebrated appropriately for what they're contributing. Okay. That's a great, a great question. I think there is a ton on, I think this hits on not just how past generations were raised, but also 
our work contract and worth work ethic um, that has been put into our society over basically the last century um, or so. This is something I'm really interested in. Maybe part of my second book will be um, our resistance to rest and how our work culture impacts that. Um, but I think it it goes into how we're raised too, because um, a lot of maybe even our moms or our mother's mothers did not go to work um, or they were secretaries or they worked in hard labor um, and their way of coming into their career looked completely different. I know that I even personally have a, like an interesting relationship with my mom in many ways because she can't relate to anything with corporate America or um, with, you know, building a company or tech or anything like that because it just never was in her wheelhouse. And she also didn't experience the um, the same things that I did when trying to rise up in my career. And so I think that one thing that we can do is remember that we're here to support the future generations and not necessarily the past generations. I just saw a quote about this and I thought this was really like valuable is we need to help people move forward. We don't always have to worry about how we got to where we got. We just need to help people move forward in their in their own way. And so I kind of look at that as like how women can continue to rise. Let's take our individual knowledge, make it more of a collective knowledge and help those women to move forward because our daughters, our nieces, you know, whoever it might be are looking at a completely different work trajectory than even we did. Um, and so I think it's just sharing our knowledge and information and helping to support them moving forward. I hope that that helped answer your question. Um, you also, I'm going to go to Jennifer's question and then I'll go to Olivia's second question. Um, Jennifer asked, what are some tech conferences um, that you would recommend for leaning and learning and networking, especially for newbies? So I love the Grace Hopper conference. Um, I know it might be a little bit more than newbie style, but it's all women. It is women from all different, um, all different companies, all different levels of their career. It's, I don't know, I always enjoy going to it. I think that's a really good one. There's several online ones. I think that's women in tech, um, tech women. I will put together like a, a list and it's actually going to be part of the resource guide for my book. Um, and so you can definitely check back for that, but, uh, definitely Grace Hopper. That's one of my favorites. Also, you know, don't just go to conferences just for women. Um, I try to encourage that to people too. Um, they're the web summit conferences are really good. They're huge, but you're going to meet a lot of people. Um, and it, I encourage you to get in rooms with not just women. I think that's actually extremely supportive to your career. Um, and helping you to kind of learn more about it. And um, yeah, I'll think about some other ones. And then Olivia asked, what advice do you have to pivot specific technical or market experience into a, a new domain? So I think whenever we're going to make a pivot in our, our career is really what specific domain do you want to go in and finding out really what are those specific jobs that you could transfer knowledge to. So for me, even as coming out of building a tech company, obviously I was like a CEO and I was running the tech product and I was doing a million things. That doesn't necessarily transfer into corporate America directly, um, but I looked in it and I'm not gonna go back to a traditional job. I've realized that's not for me, um, but I did look at like product lead roles and everything because I was running product um, at, at my job before. Uh, I went into entrepreneurship and then I was still leading product. So where are your transferable skills? Um, I think that's a really big thing. If you are, for instance, like a marketer, but want to go more into tech, maybe you can work on like product growth, or maybe you want to dive into working at a startup where you can get lots of different experience bring your industry knowledge, but dive in and learn more about building um, a tech product. Um, I think anytime you can take a little bit of a leap when you're jumping into a pivot, um, the better. So that would be my overall advice. Um, hopefully that's helpful. 
Do we have any other questions in the chat? Just a bunch of people chiming in with their thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this was fantastic, Brooke. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. And congrats again on the book. Um, I don't know if you don't want this to be public, but you're actually going to be heading out on a book tour. So some of our folks, particularly in New York City this coming spring, might have a chance to come meet you in person. Yes, yes. And I actually can tell you, I do know the, the New York City date. So for all of you New York City people, um, I'll be be posting this on my website in, in about a week, but it's going to be on April 23rd at, which is the day the book comes out, which is exciting, at 7 p.m. Um, at her workplace, which is a company that I advise in New York City. It's in Bryant Park. Um, we have a lot of space, so I can invite kind of anybody, which is wonderful, but you can register for that in about a week on my website. I would love for you to be there. We're going to have some amazing women that are in tech, out of tech, that are all building the future in some way. Um, and I think it'll be a really cool event for you to not only network in some capacity, but also to learn some more. So I'd love to have you there. I'll also be coming to Boston in the fall. Um, fingers crossed. That sounds like when I'm going to be there and I'll be coming to quite 13 total cities. So um, be on the lookout, but I'd love to have you at one of the events. Awesome. Well, Brooke, I, it's really great. You're so willing to share even your email address with everybody, but um, I, I, I've been looking forward to this and appreciate you again with the rescheduling, all those things. It was great, uh, great stuff that you shared with our community today. So thank, on behalf of the entire university, I, I want to say thank you. Of course. No, thank you. It's always, for me, it's for years of building, a lot of people helped to support me, and now it's kind of my time to be able to give back a little. Um, so I enjoy that, and really feel free to email me. Um, I know that some people wouldn't say that, but I think that whenever we're able to help and support, even if it's a quick one-liner of here's a resource, um, I think that that can be really valuable. So if you're looking for a mentor or somebody, and, and I encourage people with this, like not every mentor is going to be able to give you an hour once a month or every week, but you can have a lot of different mentors or people in your life that can help to support you. Um, so don't feel bad about reaching out. I think it's important. People want to help. Well, thank you again, Brooke, and thanks to everybody who tuned in today, particularly those of you who've who've supported BU with your donations in the past. Our next actual webinar in March is actually going to be really nicely dovetails with so much of what we talked about today with um, being a working parent. And, and so on March 15th, we're actually going to be having a session called Back to Workshop. Uh, it's a workshop. Uh, integrating professional aspirations with personal values. So again, March 15th, you can sign up for that now on our website at bu.edu alumni. Um, and thanks again, everybody for your time. And, and thank you one, one final time, Brooke. Of course. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day or a great evening, wherever you might be, folks. Take care.